guys, welcome back to In Case of Econ Struggles. Welcome to another math struggle. Today we're going to start talking about Lagrangian optimization and economics. This is going to be a couple part series just to build up to dynamic optimization using Lagrangians. But what I've seen recently is a lot of people struggling with Lagrangian optimization, including setting it up, taking the first order conditions, and interpreting the first order conditions. So that's probably what I want to do, and I want to get started today in this first video. So what I want you to get out of this video is I want you to be able to set up a Lagrangian when you're given a set of equations. I want you to understand what we're trying to do with a Lagrangian in general. I want you to understand the lambda or the Lagrange multiplier in the Lagrangian, so we'll talk about what that means. Also go over what that means in a little more detail in the next video. Then I want you to be able to find and interpret the first order conditions once you set up the Lagrangian. And finally, I want you to be able to use those first order conditions in order to find the optimal value both for your variable that you're choosing, as well as your objective function. So timestamps are below if you would like to jump around, but let's go ahead and get right into it. So the way I wanna motivate Lagrangian optimization is that it's really no different than what you've been doing before in maybe your micro or your macro classes. It's just a different tool to get to the same answer. So just as an example, let's consider utility maximization. So in utility maximization, we have some utility function. We have two goods, x1 and x2. We have a budget, which is P1X1 plus P2X2 is equal to W. And further, we have two choice variables. We get to choose X1 and X2. So those are what we call our choice variables. And then we have some parameters, which are just given to us in the problem. And our parameters in this problem are P1, P2, and W. So those are called parameters. There's also another set of variables called state variables, but we're not dealing with that yet. Currently, we're just dealing with choice variables and parameters. And what you did in maybe your intermediate micro class, and maybe what you did is you set the MRS equal to the ratio of the prices, or the margin ratio of substitution, or MRS, is just equal to the margin utility of good one over the margin utility of good two, and you set that equal to P1 and P2. And all you were really doing when you were doing that is you were saying, well, for each good, the marginal benefit has to be equal to the marginal cost. So this is the marginal benefit equal marginal cost of good one, this is the marginal benefit, marginal cost of good two, and you are dividing them. And so those are basically two sort of first order conditions, where you have a first order condition for good one, and you have a first order condition for good two. That's exactly what we're going to see as we move into this Lagrangian, but again, just giving you some background. And then once we had the MRS is equal to the ratio of the prices, we use the budget constraint to find x1 star and x2 star, and then we plug those optimal values into our utility function to find what we called our value function, or v of x1 and x2, or v of p1, p2, and w, because we wanted this value function to just be in terms of the parameters, not in terms of the choice variables. So that's what we did. And now, if we think about the same utility maximization problem in sort of Lagrangian, here's how we would set this up. So what we're going to do is we are maximizing utility. It could have been a min, but we're maximizing. We get to choose x1 and x2, so I like to put those things in curly brackets. We're trying to maximize our objective function. The objective function is just a fancy word for the thing that we're trying to maximize or minimize. So here we care about utility. We're trying to maximize utility. So the utility function is our objective function. And we have a constraint. And just like before, we still have a budget constraint. It's p1x1 plus p2x2 is equal to w. So now that we have that, let's form this into a Lagrangian, because this is still not quite a Lagrangian, because a Lagrangian is going to have this Lagrangian multiplier lambda. So let's go one step further. And now what you can see is this is a full-blown Lagrangian, because I have added in lambda times my constraint. Notice that what I've done is I've set my constraint equal to zero. And the reason I've set my constraint equal to zero is because the whole point of this Lagrangian multiplier is this second part should be equal to zero because I'm allowed to add and subtract zero from an equation. That's totally fine. But if I'm going to put this and I'm going to add this to u of x1 and x2, it's got to be equal to zero. So in order for that to be equal to zero, one of two things must be true. Either w minus p1x1 minus p2x2 must be equal to zero, which means I spend all my money, and then this lambda doesn't have to be zero, or lambda is equal to zero and I don't spend all my money. So those are the two ways that can be equal to zero. One of them must be true in order for me to be able to add them into this Lagrangian. So if that's confusing, or you'd like me to try and explain that slightly differently, put a comment below. Otherwise, let's keep going. So what in the world is this lambda even doing other than making sure that this whole part is equal to zero? Well, what it's doing is it's telling you if your budget constraint is going to bind, first of all, 
because if this is not equal to zero, then that means your constraint binds. And if it is equal to zero, then it will be the case that your constraint doesn't bind. I'll go over that again in just a second. So if you're still a little confused, give me a couple more minutes. And if you're still confused, definitely feel free to throw a comment below. But basically what it's gonna tell you is it's gonna tell you how much your utility goes up if I relax your constraint a little bit. So in this context, what it's gonna mean is if I gave you an extra dollar in your wallet, this Lambda would tell you how your utility would change when I gave you that extra dollar in your wallet. And that's what we call sort of the shadow price of wealth, just as a preview. Again, I'm gonna talk very specifically about the shadow price of wealth in the next video, but that is what this Lambda tells you. So let's keep going on this Lambda and see if I can help you understand intuitively what's happening. So we know that Lambda times your constraint where your constraint is set equal to zero must be equal to zero in some way. So the first possibility is that your budget constraint is binding. So if this is true, this means that P1X1 plus P2X2 must be equal to W, which means you spend all your money, and then lambda is not equal to zero. And then lambda tells you if you have a little bit more money in your wallet, in your budget, how much better your utility could be. The other possibility, because there's no stealing allowed, is that this constraint is not equal to zero, and the only way this constraint would not be equal to zero is if you didn't quite spend all your money, and then lambda would be equal to zero. Why would lambda be equal to zero? Lambda would be equal to zero because if you're not spending all your money, then giving you an extra dollar shouldn't help your utility. Let me give you an example sort of graphically. So on this axis, here's the utility, here's your objective function, here's the amount of money in your pocket, and here is the actual budget you have. So this is like all possible budgets, and this W bar is the actual amount of money you walked into the store with today. So in case one, where lambda does not be equal to zero, and if you think about utility where you just like more stuff in general, your utility might look something like this, where even though it's going up at a slower rate, your utility is still higher as you get more money. And the only reason that we stop here is because you can't spend more than what you walked into the store with. So that is the case where your constraint is binding. You would really like to buy more at the store, but you can't because you don't have that much money. So Lambda would tell you, if I gave you a little bit more money, if I increased your budget, how much would you go up in terms of utility? So that would be Lambda right there. And you can see that this Lambda is not equal to zero because it's positive. Because if I gave you more money, your utility would go up. Now for case two, if you're not spending all your money, maybe your utility function looks something like this, where you have a point where you're maximizing your utility. It's right here and notice you didn't spend all your money. And because you didn't spend all your money, if I were to give you a little bit more money, then you would not change the bundle you bought. You would just put that extra dollar back in your pocket and it wouldn't change what you buy. And because it wouldn't change what you buy, your utility would not change. And so the change in utility when I change the amount of money in your wallet would be equal to zero because nothing about your situation would change if I gave you an extra dollar. So in that case, Lambda would be equal to zero just put an arrow to make it clear. So again, I'm gonna talk about this all again in the next video, totally separately, but I thought it would be useful to just start talking about. If you're confused about anything in particular, please let me know in the comments so that when I make that second video, I can sort of add anything that you guys are confused about. But the main thing that I want you to take away from this slide is that when you set up the Lagrangian, what you're gonna do is you're gonna say min or max, the variables you're choosing, the objective function plus lambda, times your constraint where you've set your constraint equal to zero. So now that we've done that, let's go over an example problem. And specifically, let's use the utility maximization still. So here's a Lagrangian, I'm gonna call this fancy L. And now first order conditions of a Lagrangian, I can only take first order conditions of the things that I'm choosing. I'm choosing two things, X1 and X2. So the first thing to note is I can always take a first order condition with respect to my Lagrangian. That just gives me my constraint back. It's not super useful, but it's useful to know because I'm gonna use this budget constraint in order to find my X star and my P star. But what I'm going to focus on first is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to X1. So first, this has X1 in it. The derivative of this with respect to X1 is just du dx1 plus lambda. The only time X1 pops into my constraint is right here. So lambda times negative P1 is equal to zero. I'm setting my first order condition equal to zero because when I optimize, that's what's gonna happen. And so notice, just if I interpret this a little bit, 
This says that my marginal benefit of x1, which is just equal to du dx1, is equal to lambda times p1, which is equal to the marginal cost. And if I were to do the same thing with respect to x2, this derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x2 would be du dx2. Again, these are partial derivatives, plus lambda minus p2 is equal to zero. And if I simplify that a little bit, I just have two little equations, du dx1 is equal to lambda p1 in equation one, du dx2 is equal to lambda p2 for good two. But notice that this is just saying when the lambdas cancel, that mu1, which is du dx1, over mu2, which is du dx2, is equal to the ratio of the prices, which I know means that this says that MRS is equal to the ratio of marginal utilities, which is equal to the ratio of the prices at the optimum, which is exactly what we had before when we were doing it the non-Lagrangian way. So this sort of checks and helps you understand that what we're doing is essentially the same as what we've been doing in economics. It's just a different way of doing it. It's a different way of mathematically finding the answer. So now that we've done the economic example, let's just focus on the math. So I'm gonna do an example that's not related to economics at all. And the reason I'm doing that is just to get you used to what's happening. So maybe I have an objective function of x1, x2 plus 2x1. My constraint is 4x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 60. If you wanted, this is the same as 2x1 plus x2 is equal to 30. You're gonna get the same exact answer. And so if you wanna follow along and try it with the constraint divided by two, you're perfectly happy to do that. You should get the same answer that I do. And so we're just gonna maximize the objective function. This is the objective function plus lambda times the constraint equal to zero. It also doesn't matter if I were to do this the other way. So I could have also said lambda 4x1 plus 2x2 minus 60. Again, I'm gonna get the same exact answer whichever version that I pick. So again, feel free to experiment and verify that's true if you want. Otherwise, let's go on to some first order conditions. So first order condition with respect to x1, I'm gonna take the partial of the objective function with respect to x1. So that's just gonna be x2 plus two. And then I have lambda. I'm gonna use this version of the constraint right here. So that's gonna be minus four. That's gonna be equal to zero. For dl dx2 or partial Lagrangian partial x2, that's just gonna be x1. This is lambda. This is minus two. Again, that's equal to zero. And I can take my derivative with respect to lambda to get my constraint back which is just 60 minus 4x1 minus 2x2, whichever version of the constraint you're using is equal to zero. And now I have my three first order conditions. And just like when we were doing utility maximization, I'm gonna use my constraint to solve for x1 and x2, and that's gonna help me figure out what the answer is. So if I just go down, maybe I'll copy these guys. We can just start simplifying and see what happens. So here are my two first order conditions. This says that x2 plus 2 is equal to 4 lambda. This one says that x1 is equal to 2 lambda, which means that 2x1 is equal to 4 lambda. So if I put these two guys together, what I'm going to get is that x2 plus 2 is equal to 2x1, which means that x1 is equal to x2 plus 2 over 2. And now that I'm in first order conditions, these are really stars because these, when I set the first order conditions equal to zero, I'm solving for the optimal x1 and x2, not just any x1 and x2, so I can use stars. And now I know that my constraint is 60 is equal to 4x1 plus 2x2, which means that 60 must be equal to four times x2 plus two over two plus two x2 which is just gonna mean that this is 2x2 plus four plus 2x2 is equal to 60, which means that 4x2 is equal to 56. And this means that x2 is equal to 14. And if x2 star is equal to 14, the next one is 14 plus two over two, which is 16 over two, which is eight. So now I have my x2 star and my x1 star. I can use that to find that lambda star is going to be equal to one over two x one star, which is going to be equal to four. I could have also done it using this equation right here, 
which would have said that 14 plus 2 is 4 lambda, so 16 is 4 lambda, so also lambda star is equal to 4. And y star, if I want to find the optimal value of my objective function, I'm going to plug my 14 and my 8 directly into this equation. And if I plug my x1 star and my x2 star into that equation, I'm going to get 216. So that is just a way that we can use our Lagrangian to find the optimal values of x1 star and x2 star. Lambda star tells me that if I relax this constraint, I'm going to get to a higher value of y star, and y star is the value of my objective function evaluated at the optimum. There is another way you can solve this problem. Some professors are okay with you solving it this way and some are not. So before you do this method, you should definitely ask either your TA or your professor if it's an okay method to solve this question. But this is a method I like to use because generally it helps me get the right answer with fewer mistakes. And the reason it helps me get the answer with fewer mistakes is because I'm going to substitute. So I'm going to take this constraint, the same constraint we just had, I'm going to solve it for x2, and I'm going to say that x2 is 30 minus 2x1, and I'm just going to plug this constraint in for x2, and when I solve for x1 star, I'll just come back and plug x1 star into this equation to find x2, and if I did it correctly, we should get the same exact answer as we just got. So, here we go. If I plug that in, I'm going to get this is x1 times 30 minus 2x2, that's 30x1 minus 2x1 squared plus 2x1, which is 32 minus 2x1 squared. I can just take the derivative of that because I no longer have a constraint. So I'm going to get 32 minus 4x1 as my first order condition. Again, this is going to be a star. So that means that x1 star is equal to 8, which is 30 minus 16, which is 14. So I get y star of 2, 16. x1 star and x2 star are exactly the same. The one thing to note about this is I didn't have lambda. So because I didn't have lambda, I don't have an easy way to figure out what lambda star is. So I'd sort of have to set up this Lagrangian anyway to get lambda star. So what it really is going to depend on is on if lambda star is something you need to know, or if it's something that you're not going to be asked about in the problem. So if I'm not going to be asked about lambda star in a problem, I'm probably more likely to substitute. And if I am going to be asked, hey, what is lambda star and what does lambda star mean in a given situation on this problem, probably going to set it up the Lagrangian way just because it'll be easier to get lambda star. But if that's not one of the sub questions, I'm probably going to substitute and see what I can do just with substitution. But hopefully this gives you a brief intro to Lagrangian optimization, helps you start feeling a little more comfortable with how this is working. Again, we're going to go through some different examples over the next course of videos. But if this was helpful, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.